and hello, welcome everyone to uh, Turbulence Modeling. Today we're going to continue where we left off in the last time. Um, well, actually, we already finished, discussed uh, most of our um, PRIDDES models. And yeah, this, this actually uh, causes a little bit of different way of limiting the viscosity uh, by setting a hard limit over here. It sets a really hard limit. Uh, on how much viscosity you can get okay so so called a hard limit yeah so this this is uh, one of these uh, uh, limiting functions here which uh, okay I, I guess I won't say a hard limit here it's just a kind of a limiting function that uh, reduces the overall amount of viscosity near the wall uh, and tries to control control it and this is controlled by the the relative length scales of the uh, LES, the cell length scale, and of course the turbulence length scale. And that uh, apparently helps with the log layer mismatch problem. And as you can see here, the PRIDDES model performs well for relatively uh, coarse grid sizes. So this, all of this were actually compared across the different, I mean, uh, across the same grid size. So you can sort of think of it like it's using a comparing the hybrid models with a coarse mesh, uh, coarse mesh LES. So uh, okay, coarse mesh. Why do I say it's coarse mesh? Uh, mesh is coarser than it needs to be. So that's just uh, that's just uh, what we kind of deal with over here. Uh, of course, in general, LES doesn't do as well near the walls okay um, so yeah you we also wonder you know uh, since LES doesn't do so well near the walls unless you have maybe a fine mesh a very very fine mesh that almost approaches uh, DNS yeah if you have a fine mesh that almost approaches DNS that can't defeat the whole purpose of doing LES in the first place yeah LES the point of it is to have a model and not uh, have all the turbulence simulated by DNS. But uh, if that works, I mean, if the, if your mesh is so small that it almost constitutes DNS and it gives you the result, it gives you the result. But it's going to, just going to take very long, that's all. Or impractically long. So uh, to kind of have a speed comparison, I mean, these, these two methods are generally better. Yeah, the IDDES and PLIDDES models are generally better. Um, and you, it's remarkably good for aiding mixed convection of this low Richardson number. Um, of course, if you have higher Richardson number, that's another study uh, altogether. Though if you, uh, but for higher Richardson number, DNS data wasn't available to compare, so you cannot compare error. But you can compare the rough trends in... Um, the rough trends in the the near wall functions okay so yeah for eating uh for opposing mesh convection you kind of need to make the mesh a lot finer in order to get you the right results that's the general uh, case you are seeing over here now for PRIDDES it, it can do for all of them uh, relatively well and what how how does it affect the wall functions okay or near wall behavior more likely so for the above experiment, uh, this was what was noted in the paper. The T plus profile in the region, Y plus less than 10, um, it's very good. Um, it's almost an exact match with DNS for all three models. So that goes to show all three models can model this, uh, this uh, viscous sublayer part very well. And to some extent, a little bit of the uh, buffer region. Where it starts to fall apart is during the buffer region, but even then, the maximum error uh, here is about 20-25%. 20, okay, uh, for U plus mo uh, U plus profile, a dimensionless uh, velocity, it's relatively well, well, uh, well matched in shape. Uh, but I won't uh, go too so much. The the thing I want to drive across uh, is that it. Uh, these these models, uh, regardless whether you use IDDES, will or PL uh, PLDDES, PLIDDES, PLDDES, it's able to 
match the viscous sublayer, the conduction sublayer very well. So as long as you have a fine enough mesh for the, tur the turbulence boundary layer, it should be able to do its job pretty decently. Okay, so now um, that covers uh, perhaps all the models I want to talk about for now, the turbulence models, whether it's RANS, LES, or uh, detached eddy simulations, or a hybrid of these. Okay, so uh, it, it shows that, you know, uh, Yes, uh, the models, the models, uh, they do decently. The LES models do decently, or, or even the hybrid models, they do decently. Just that you have to adjust the mesh correctly, in order for them to give you satisfactory results. Okay, and uh, of course that kind of brings me a little. Uh, yeah, that kind of uh, concludes concludes the whole discussion here. Now I just want to talk a little bit about the CFD implementation in OpenFoam. All right. Uh, so in CFD, uh, you notice that the the H field. Remember, we had our temperature equation. Oh yes, remember we had our temperature equation here. Okay, this was our temperature equation, which we made a lot of assumptions. All right, we made a lot of assumptions. Okay, this one I can just yeah, this one I can get rid of it. Uh, kind of explained already. Let's see here, yeah. Let's see. Uh, this, this, this. So I can put it here. All right. This is what we were uh, coming up with, and that actually came from. Um, that actually came from an equation looking like this, and the equation we wanted uh, was somewhere over here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't want that yet. Yeah, this this one looks good. Okay, so anyway, yeah, we often will see H actually pop up a lot over here. And this, normally we like to have our temperature uh, being the main subject of whatever we calculate. So for example, in most of the theoretical derivations, we like to calculate all of this in terms of temperature, right? We like to calculate a temperature transport equation. But in the CFD, it's a little bit different. The H field is solved for enthalpy rather than temperature directly. Perhaps it's a uh, it's easier to do that because uh, um, I mean, yeah, enthalpy is an easier scalar to to transport from field to field. It's a very natural thing uh, because that that doesn't quite depend. I mean, your 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 um, how do you say your your density and your and your heat capacity can actually vary from cell to cell in general because you have, can you can have compressible flow, you can have uh, varying properties. So it's easier to easier to just measure an energy transport. So the H field is usually calculated. So how does it look like? Now if you go to develop open form, uh, or the, the uh, solvers over here, you can see this uh, solvers heat transfer. I just take it from boil and pimple form. So this is this is basically for open form, but I shan't go too much into the code. Uh, I just want to highlight what the equation actually looks like. So how does the equation look like? You can read about it here. Here it says there's C. The FVM is finite volume method. Uh, okay, you have a rho and a HE here. HE is the HE is the energy that you are, of course, uh, doing. It can be a representative of the enthalpy. Anyway, you you see this this in terms of HE, which is it can be a um, it's related to the enthalpy internal energy kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so actually we have the HE term. Yeah, HE term here actually stands for either uh, uh, internal energy or, um, what do you call that? Internal energy or enthalpy. This K is actually a, a mechanical work term. So you know, uh, first law of thermodynamics is uh, U equals to Q plus W. So W is the work done. So this represents that sort of work done on the system term. 
Then this one, we, we have a dp dt term, okay, which is also constituting the work done, but uh, it is, okay, where's the term here? Okay, I better go and check. Did I copy, did I copy the right equation over? Just a minute. Yeah, uh, the equation should be here, right here. Yeah, this is the equation, I think. So let's go. Uh, this one should be the one. Now this is the way the energy equation kind of is put in here. So this is uh, using enthalpy of course. Uh, this is the dp dt term and the buoyancy term over here. Uh, the rest are you know heat generation. This is heat flux. You probably do it. You probably get it from either radiation or conduction. Now this is heat generation term. Okay, uh, probably gets from some chemical or other kind of reaction. This is you know uh, dissipative forces at work. Okay, so here you have. Uh, kin uh, uh, kinetic energy here you have this uh, pressure term the dpdt term the very big dpdt term here you have a laplacian of uh, alpha effective and he this is actually the conduction term over here so if you want to take a look um, one very useful resource is that from openform.org they have very nice documentation of this so how how they would uh, see this uh, you, how you see this uh, energy equation here? All right, you see this energy equation here. Um, yeah, you see this uh, energy equation here, and the total energy. They they have a this is the first law implementation implementation. They have a total energy, which is uh, which is okay. You see this components. They have mechanical energy. Which is, of course, you can think of it as a work done. Okay, it's a work done kind of thing. You can convert kinetic energy into heat energy, heat energy into kinetic energy. Uh, so this is a total energy. It's not just a heat energy balance. It's a total energy balance. So you have a kinetic energy term here. Kinetic energy term. So usually kin kinetic energy is being transformed into some heat at times. So. Uh, but anyway, so you have a kinetic energy term here. You have a thermodynamic energy term here, which is the uh, internal energy at first. All right. Um, then you have you have heat flux. You have a heat source, which is the uh, heat flux is here. Heat source is here. So heat flux. Uh, heat flux is a there's a heat flux vector which you can have a conduction or radiation component into it. All right, and then you have you put these together. Then you have this thermodynamic energy, mechanical energy. Then you have uh, these contributing terms on the right. Okay. Um, so you you have this. Uh, you have some uh, more manipulations, etc., etc. You can read more about it here. But the more juicy part, the better part uh, to look at, look at is this. Uh, this one's very interesting. It says that uh, you you the equation here is structured such that you can either put H or E into the equation and you'll be solved. All right. Um, so this this term, this dpdt term, actually changes. That's why it's so complicated here. It actually changes depending on whether you put. Uh, um, H, uh, you you base your base your uh, equation on H, which is an enthalpy or internal energy. Okay, so this is how uh, open form does it. The conduction term is here, and of course you can have other things, other contribute, other contributing uh, energy terms here, uh, which is very similar in in fact to this uh, buoyant pimple form solver. And then of course you have radiation here, which they kind of separate out from the Laplacian term. And this Laplacian, uh, this all of this here is on the left hand side. Then you have the equal. Then you have all of this on the right hand side. So we have the the buoyancy term. It looks like I think, uh, yeah. Oh, hold on, I don't. Let's see.
Yeah. Uh, the point. Look, it looks like this. This is the buoyancy term because there's a G inside. So this actually gives rise to some of the. It's a source term in a sense, for uh, en uh energy. So, yeah, I think that looks like that. Uh, the radiation heat flux is here. Then you have of course other sources of heat over here. And of course your your turbulence is actually accounted for in here because of this alpha effective. As you know, uh, alpha effective uh, is both the conduction alpha as well as the turbulent kinetic uh, turbulent alpha. Alright, so the, you see this whole thing is solved in terms of um, in terms of H or E rather than temperature. Uh, it's a more perhaps more efficient to do this because you don't have to keep multiplying rho C P and T. Instead you just keep track of uh, H or E which are already you know conserved uh, well conserved and well accounted for in this equation. So that's how uh, open form has this energy equation. So I just went through it briefly, not gonna go through what each term is exactly here. Okay, just roughly what the the um what do you call it? Just roughly what the the terms represent physically, just to give you an idea. Okay, so this energy equation here is the same regardless of turbulence model. Where, where, where your turbulence model comes into play here is in this alpha effective. So that's why your whole parental number and everything there is pretty important. And for this, you actually have two files actually the, um, uh, making note of why this parental number is defined. First is in this eddy diffusivity.h where this uh, parental number default is 0 uh, 1.0 and this is basically for most of your of your um, for most of your um, what do you call it most of your domain most of the fluids uh, it will be this alpha t which you use except of course for the boundary conditions here because you have this line here alpha t correct boundary conditions which will change alpha near the boundaries so uh, okay let's see so uh, I should not paste this okay I should not paste uh, this is from 28 to 43 okay so in eddy diffusivity.c the idea is that uh, we have okay eddy diffusivity c line 30 to 43 okay line 30 to 43 okay is uh, the idea is we have a constant prt turbulent parental number to calculate alpha t all right uh, at all places except for near boundary okay because there is this this line of code here that says um, after after you calculate the alpha you kind of need to correct with the boundary conditions uh, so where in line 42 so here is where it is in line 42 uh, alpha t alpha t is corrected in the boundary condition Okay, so this is the line which you use alpha t dot correct boundary conditions. So this is very important for us to know. Okay, so so yeah, this this important to know that in the code, you know, you you can actually define two l two parental numbers in open form. One is in the bulk of the fluid. One is due to the boundary conditions. And for the boundary conditions, one example which it's uh, important is your standard alpha t boundary uh, condition, which your parental number is defined by default as 0 0.85. Of course, you can change it as you want. And likewise, for the rest of the rest of the uh, code, I mean, it allows you to define uh, parental number. So it says here, read parental number, uh, turbulent parental number it provided, which you can set your turbulent parental number to whatever value you want for the bulk of the fluid and of course you can set the parental number for this near the wall of the fluid okay so this this actually helps a little bit with the varying parental number 
Okay, so uh, this this is where I mean if you search your own open form, you can see this, and there are a number of wall functions which uh, I'll uh, I'll just stop for now. Uh, next time. Uh, next time we'll discuss a little bit more about the alpha t wall functions I mean there's the basic one which you see here uh, over here this alpha t wall function but there are little uh, there, are, there are kinds that are a little bit more complex but uh, I'll stop for now thanks for watching see you guys next time bye bye